Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this second uh, edition of the Global Classroom uh, Program. Um, I'm Indrajit Roy at the University of York, where I teach on the global development politics um, uh, themes. Uh, and this is a global classroom global class. that we are we piloting for um, an upcoming program for next year. Um, the rationale for a, a global classroom program such as this and uh, thinking about the politics of global development uh, more broadly uh, is uh, lies in the fact that the world as we know it is uh, changing. Although it's richer than ever before in recorded history, it's also more unequal. Um, life chances have improved for millions, uh, but many continue to be deprived of access to basic services. Uh, we are uh, a more urban world than ever before, uh, and uh, automation and artificial intelligence have challenged core assumptions of human personhood. At the same time, climate change is altering relations between human beings and their environment in unprecedented ways. And the political order and economic structures that frame social life for over two centuries are under intense questioning. Um, it's for this reason that the discipline of development is also undergoing a transformation. Uh, development challenges are no longer uh, limited to nations that used to be labeled as developing countries. Um, and when we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals uh, at the United Nations in 2015, uh, we recognized the explicitly global nature of development challenges. So the global classroom is a way to pull together resources from across the world, um, from our partner universities, um, and to think together about the politics of global development. Um, last week, uh, we were taken on a tour of the ways in which development could be reimagined uh, by our colleague Naresh Singh at uh, the OP Jindal University. Um, this week, uh, our colleague and friend Alan Marshall from Mahidol University will talk to us about climate change and development. Uh, the way this uh, is, a session is planned is that uh, Alan will speak for about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, followed by question and answers from uh, the audience or from others. Um, so, the, and I should mention that the lecture component uh, is recorded, but the question and answers are not. Um, so, over to you, Alan. I shall switch off my video and hand over the spotlight to you. Okay, so thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of the global classroom. And, uh... It's a real joy for me to be able to present globally at different time zones all around the world. I haven't done this very much, so you must forgive me for being a little bit slow with the technology. I press that button, I press that button, and then I go back to the beginning. And then hopefully, you can give me a thumbs up that says you can all see that, or at least one person <laughs> give me a thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm carrying on the theme from last week in the title and manner and style, in that I'm regarding this as a reimagining of development ideas or an approach to teaching development studies in the acknowledged age of climate change. Now, some of the countries in which some of us reside have declared a climate emergency and some others have not. So I will let you decide which approach is appropriate uh, by the end of this uh, lecture, maybe you will be closer to knowing what you think about this particular issue. Okay, so uh, just as a preamble, many years ago, maybe a dozen years ago, I was in a faculty retreat. And you know, when you get involved in a faculty retreat as an academic or a postgrad student, 
you often have these brainstorming exercises. So we had a brainstorming exercise about innovative, out of the box thinking to solve policy problems and to address social issues. So I forget the exact issue we were trying to have a brainstorming session about. It was something like creative approaches to environmental problems or creative approaches to climate policies, something like that, okay? So uh, one of the things that we, we were storming and drinking lots of coffee early in the morning on this retreat in this beautiful hotel was coming up with uh, cultural ways to uh, get more people interested in climate change, looking at climate change from uh, around the world. And one of the ideas that came up was the idea of approaching urban transformations to eco-friendliness using a kind of literary method, an acknowledgement that each country, each rural area, each urban area has literary traditions that go back sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. And from that li literature, literary tradition, we can have some sort of wisdom as to how to project a future. And so these crazy creative ideas, that was just one of them, you know, usually dissipate during the, the coffee break and we never go back to them. But this one stuck with me for years until I decided to turn it into a project. Now, since uh, our opening salvo, our opening lecture was about reimagining development, I'm gonna continue that theme and continue the idea of uh, projecting. Uh, the, the, the last lecture, we had the idea that the, the world is a very complex place and to uh, plan for change, we needed complexity theory and that we have to maybe think about radical changes and uh, unforeseen events. So this also works with that idea, okay? So I, <laughs> I was emboldened to develop this uh, radical approach from, from being allowed <laughs> intellectually to do it during the, the last issue, okay? Obviously there's some uh, problems associated with that, though the, the obvious one is that it, it doesn't seem very practical, but uh, if you have any questions about that, I will attempt to answer them at the end, okay? So this, I believe, is a process for reimagining development. And when I'm teaching uh, my four or five lectures about development theory, I just bring all the familiar development studies uh, work that I did. My master's degree was in the Institute of Development Studies in my home country, New Zealand. And, uh, you know, I, I look at familiar theories of underdevelopment, world systems theory, all that sort of stuff, okay? But none of this is very original for me to sit and tell you that. And if there are development studies students out there that are, are going to watch this, maybe you're not going to want me to uh, share 1950s and 1960s theories of uh, development studies and claim that it's somehow a reimagining. But this, I can claim, is my own original work and is reimagining and is also quite radical. And uh, even if you, I don't have any firm followers or adherents by the end, I'm, I'm sure you will uh, hopefully see that it is uh, working out a way to predict our futures in an eco-friendly manner. Okay, so that's the preamble. The very one slide devoted to theory, okay? This is this, the method steps for the uh, literary method of urban design. And I've practiced this on my students a number of times. And again, the feedback is, oh, wow, that's really interesting. That's really intriguing. So maybe you can try it with your uh, students if you happen to be a tutor or a teacher in development studies. Uh, step one, you select a work of literature. So I get my students to select their favorite piece of literature, okay? Or a favorite piece of literature, a favorite novel perhaps, or a fam famous national poem. Then they select a city. Usually 
they're advised to select uh, either the city they study in or the city that they come from because they will know it uh, in some degree of intimacy. Step three, they predict the developmental future of their chosen city and its social and environmental challenges using the themes and events of the chosen work of literature. Obviously, this is the hard part. And hopefully if they come from that city and they've read the book, they are in some ways connected to the two subjects that they're gonna use in the methodology. Okay, they know the culture of the city, the geography of the city, the problems of the city, and with a little bit of prodding and a workshop on the uh, environmental and political background of that city and perhaps its history and arts as well, they can, uh, within a short time, uh, become even more familiar with either their home city or the city that they're studying at, okay? And step four, uh, they present this urban plan in a graphic or textual way. Uh, which means that they're outlining a narrative of transformation from the way that the city is today to potentially a better, more eco-friendly city. Or if their work of literature inspires them to predict that the city is going to get worse and very bad and the problems are just going to get worse and very bad, they can outline that particular story graphically and through text. Now, it sounds like I'm asking the students to uh, get involved in graphic design or urban design, and only a very few of my students have any uh, experience of that, but, uh, you know, I give them all the encouragement and tools to at least work out a, a, a high school picture of their particular city, or to practice it on familiar uh, software that the students are familiar with, or I have done this just once, uh, encourage the students to use AI, to use uh, textual prompts into an AI art uh, creator that gives an idea of, of their particular city from photographs that they've personally taken and using the themes that they've identified by it in literature. And the students at least learn tools of AI, which is good technically, maybe not so great if I'm encouraging them to uh, depend on AI to uh, come up with the uh, urban futures for their own particular city. Anyway, as an example of what I'm talking about, I'll just go through a series of case studies that I've done for the last uh, so many years, both in the classroom and outside. Um, the idea is, of course, this is supposed to be a communal community exercise. So you're supposed to encourage social studies students to go out into schools and work with uh, students that want to have a closer connection to the future of their own particular city. Okay. Now, uh, community studies people do this in the near term future sometimes in local schools, looking five years into the future. But this is not really community studies, it's urban planning studies or urban development studies, and it's far in the future. So we're looking right into the end of the century is usually the, the period, the, the chronicle point, which I, I try to get the students to aim at. That point being uh, the time when we will know or we will see huge changes in the Earth's climate. So that's the, the point that I want to pick. And that's also a point in time in which scientists give us a figure of we can realize that either we have a 1.5 degrees rise in temperature or something much worse, three, four, or even hotter uh, Celsius degrees rise in, in the future. Okay, so this is the reason that there's a long time scale. Okay, so just to give you a view of what I'm talking about in the methodology, here's uh, some case studies I'll go through very quickly. This is a green utopian London as inspired by 500-year-old Londoner Thomas More in his uh, book called Utopia, very famous book even outside of India. 
Here's uh, Prague predicted in the future as a bohemian city. Bohemia is a word that has two meanings. It's a regional part of what is uh, Central Europe these days. And this is also uh, a lifestyle choice. Living bohemian means living a simple, non-materialistic way. And the original bohemian in the second sense is uh, a poet from California called James F. Bowman. And uh, from the first sense that I gave you, Prague is usually referred to as the capital of the geographical region of Bohemia in uh, Central Europe. So here's a, a Bohemian future of, of Prague where uh, young people are living in less materialistic ways. Here's uh, a vision of future tattoo. Uh, I was just commissioned uh, as part of the uh, European Capital of Culture to come up with this based on a novel called uh, The Willow King, an award-winning novel by an award-winning uh, Estonian novelist called Milas Friedenthal, which is a, a woodland city set far in the future. Here's uh, some modern literature, almost science fiction. Uh, it's called Solar Punk, in which people forget about having their cities designed by central authorities and they go and do it themselves. And this way, this uh, very large city of Turkey called Antalya is a uh, turned into a uh, zero waste, carbon neutral, uh, solar powered city. If I can make this bit bigger, it might help everybody there. Uh, this is the future uh, of Almaty, the uh, past capital of Kazakhstan, but not the capital anymore which was uh, based on a, a book uh, called Apples Are from Kazakhstan. Okay, and it's looking at the reinvigorated apple forest of uh, Amati's future. Ka Kazakhstan is the primordial home of the domesticated apple in human history. Okay, this is Future Wellington, actually my home city, based on uh, Tolkien's The Hobbit. Uh, for those who have seen the movie, then you might know that uh, it was filmed in uh, Wellington some decades ago now. Okay, so we're moving on to the case study that I'm choosing to look at climate change in our urban futures, okay? And the novel selected is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. You might be surprised to know it's from the early 19th century, and uh, Mary Shelley wrote this uh, while she was in Switzerland, exiled with, uh, this, this is the name of the project which I developed from it, the Franken Cities project. And on the left there, you will see Mary Shelley, who was uh, the wife of Percy Shelley, or at least the fiance, of Percy Shelley at the time she wrote uh, uh, Frankenstein. And they were in exile from uh, England because they were from the petty part of the aristocracy. If they weren't married and they were obviously uh, having a relationship and this was a bit of a scandal. So they ran away to meet with an even more scandalous figure of literary history in England. That is Lord Byron, who you can see in the middle who as well as being a scandalous poet and a rock star of uh, early 19th century artistic culture in England, he was uh, also exiling himself in um, Switzerland with his good friend, John William Polidori. And so all these figures are scandalous for very various reasons. They all uh, had, were involved in relationships that they according to early 19th century culture, they shouldn't have been involved in. And they're all involved in, uh, in imbibing uh, illegal substances, or at that time they were legal, but they were frowned upon. And they were in this villa, which uh, 
Lord Byron was renting. Lord Byron had his own mini zoo, which he took everywhere he went. So they were also occupied by llamas and parrots and sheep and goats. And they uh, locked themselves away in a room and drunk a lot and wrote lots of stories, including during one stormy night, uh, Mary Shelley came up with the Frankenstein, which uh, got turned into so many different plays and movies and video games. And John Polidori came up with the first modern vampire story. So from Frankenstein, I took the uh, commonly accepted psychological, social, literary themes that other literary critics have identified in Frankenstein, alienation. Uh, the monster is alienated from the rest of society, monstrosity. The monster, Frankenstein's monster is hideous to look at and nobody particularly likes him. The monster is also uh, a subject of abandonment. He gets abandoned by his uh, creating scientist. The monster is also uh, a, a figure of stigma. Nobody wants to be seen with him. Nobody wants to be kind to him. And the, the another theme of Frankenstein is of technological hubris. The scientist that invented uh, Frankenstein, the monster, is said to have overstepped the boundaries of good technological ethics and, and creating a new human. It's just not the right thing to do. Even nowadays, it's frowned upon. So in the early 19th century, when England was a much more Christian value society, it was frowned upon there. And so Mary Shelley was exploring all these themes and they're still identified in many Frankenstein movies today. Indeed, they could be said to be, this could be said to be the first science fiction novel and every almost every single science fiction movie that we see in modern day society goes through these common themes. Okay, so they're, they're not particularly strange. And of course, urban studies uh, people, I noticed um, over the course of uh, a few years of studying this, have also identified these themes when they examine problems in modern cities, alienation. Uh, communities are alienated from each other through uh, physically or through socially or financially. They're alienated from the decisions involved in setting up the city. They're even alienated from other individual human beings because they're increasingly living on their own. Cities are also regarded as monstrous by many people, including those that live outside of them in the countryside and those that live <laughs> inside of them. Cities are often subject of abandonment. There are places which are urban wastelands. There are places where people do not want to go unless you have no uh, other uh, financial power. That you, you have to uh, live in those particular places. Some parts of cities are also associated with stigma, either socially or through environmental pollution. Uh, and cities are also suffer from technological hubris. Sometimes the easiest way to get cities to, uh, to solve the social problems of cities is to invent a new, some form of new technology. And this uh, doesn't usually work. So my argument is that uh, we need to, we can use these themes to uh, predict the futures of uh, cities, as well as explaining how cities were formed in the past. Okay, so I'll go through Two stories as we go through this. The short, not so significant story is the story within the Frankenstein novel and the more important story about the urban futures. So supposedly Dr. Frankenstein, the inventor of the Frankenstein monster, uh, was born in Naples in Italy sometime in the, the year that Shelley picks was actually the birth, the same year as the start of, <laughs> excuse me, of the uh, French Revolution. So uh, that's the late uh, 18th century. So Dr. Frankenstein was born in Naples, but that's because his family, his Swiss family, were on a sojourn around Europe, and Naples is one of the, the, uh, common stops if you're interested in looking at classical Europe. 
this is what Naples would have looked like approximately the time that uh, Frankenstein or Dr. Frankenstein was supposedly born there. And also uh, during 1817, this is what it <laughs> looked like in the approximate time that uh, Mary Shelley visited when she went there with Percy Shelley. Okay, as you can see, Mount Vesuvius is uh, throwing smoke in the background. So this is our predicted future. Let's say the end of this century, the final decade of uh, the 21st century. Uh, unfortunately, there are huge noxious poisonous gases that regularly flow over the city. So people have taken to living underground or just moving away because the poisonous noxious gases are just so deleterious to the common uh, Naples residents lungs. So it's very hard to survive there. But fortunately you can dig in the soft volcanic uh, substrate, the earth of Naples and carve out caverns and carve out harms. And in fact, Neapolitans have been doing this for 3,000 years, okay? Because the, the soft pumice-like stone is easy to dig. And archeologists dig up a uh, 2,000 year old wine that has been stored uh, for uh, since uh, Roman times. They have dug out 2,500 year old Greek uh, urns of olive oil that uh, Greek, when Naples was Greek from uh, the, the time it was founded, this was commonly the place where you store things to keep them cool. Sometimes you would build crypts for your family, your dead family members as well, and they could survive there in the dry, cool environments for uh, decades and decades. And some of these are still open. Uh, in later Roman times, they took to building cisterns and waterways and uh, water storage tanks as well. So it's a familiar part of Naples' uh, urban landscape is to build under there. And in modern times, people also built their family banks and uh, uh, safe deposits as well and, and, and stored them down there. So it's kind of a tradition. And this tradition is pushed forward in the future. And, uh, Frank and Naples is a subterranean city. Uh, there are a few other cities in the world that uh, have this habit as well, going back sometimes to prehistory and also uh, to the early modern period as well. Okay, so because I've forewarned you about Mount Vesuvius, you're thinking that the reason that there is noxious gases regularly flying over the city is because of the volcanic ash. Well, I led you astray. The reason that there is noxious gases is because some organization, the garbage collectors, the official garbage collectors, take the garbage of Naples, and drive a short way out into the uh, outer suburbs, and then burn it. And they do this regularly. They burn the garbage because they've already collected the garbage pay uh, fees from the city council, and they burn it. And this uh, means that the noxious, terrible, uh, poisonous gases frequently come over the city and just gets worse year by year. Now, there is some contemporary uh, <laughs> exemplar of this happening in that in the recent hip, uh, history of Naples, there has been uh, the problem of uh, overabundance of uh, solid waste building up in the environment because the workers, the garbage companies went on strike. Now, most Neapolitans know that the garbage industry is managed by uh, criminal organizations as one way for them to both to make money and also to hide some of their uh, illegal activities. So for a long time, the uh, waste management system of Naples was a mafia business run by the local mafia. And sometimes the various levels of government in Italy tried to crack down of this, but the way that the uh, waste managers managed to resist these crackdowns was by refusing to collect all the garbage. So the average Neapolitan 
had to put up with either the mafia controlling the business and doing a very bad and, and unhealthy job of it, or having their streets cluttered up with uh, garbage. So the city authorities eventually rel uh, relented and said, okay, collect the garbage. We, we cannot live like this. You know, this is, this is terrible. So this idea in the future is that this practice continues in the future. And uh, unfortunately, it seems to be getting worse in that some uh, organizations who are mainly primarily devoted to illegal activities are now purchasing or were for uh, some period of time purchasing radioactive waste from outside of Italy because they're promising to dispose it in safe ways, but they just end up burning it in the countryside in cabbage fields just outside the city. Or at least this is, is what has uh, been alleged, both in academic papers and in uh, newspapers. So it's not strange in the modern world to have mafia-run garbage cities. New York had it for many years. Uh, the, the, the story that uh, the New York uh, authorities tell is that that's all history, but it's not sure. Tbilisi uh, in Georgia has also got this problem. Taipei City also has this problem, it is alleged. And Cairo also has this problem as well. Although in Cairo it's different because uh, sometimes the garbage was just uh, an, an informal disposal because the, these some sections of the suburb were not provided with the right uh, waste infrastructure. So the residents living in the shanty towns there just had to dispose of this way. But then they realized that they could make a living by uh, going through the uh, disposed of waste and recycling the, the waste for themselves. And although, you know, it's a messy and dangerous and unhealthy, it did manage to, to support the low-income uh, workers in their own private businesses. But when illegal uh, organizations saw that, that this money was being made, they unfortunately took over it as a small-time business owners to, to uh, try and run the businesses themselves as part of their illegal enterprises. Okay, so I told you that Dr. Frankenstein was uh, born in Naples. But when he got to be 18 or 19, he was sent off to Ingolstadt, a German city in Bavaria, with a very good university. At the time, it had a, a, a renowned uh, medical faculty. And uh, uh, Dr. Frankenstein, a very bright young student, and his final year project, he thought to himself, OK, what I, I want to do something to contribute to humanity and to make a name for myself as a physician, as a physiologist. What better than uh, bringing back humans to life and solving the worst medical problem of all, that is death. And the reason he did this is he, he went through his own uh, death of his own loved ones and he knew that it's a terrible thing and that uh, if he could somehow make this contribution to science, he would also make a name for himself in the scientific community. But uh, even then, digging up dead bodies was either frowned upon uh, uh, or an illegal activity. I mean, you could do it legally in this particular uh, city, but you had to go through the right uh, processes. And it's unsure whether uh, Dr. Frankenstein did this. He did get ethics advice as, as all young uh, I, undergraduate students must do and fill out the forms these days, but uh, his teacher told him, don't, don't, don't do this, this is, this is abominable. But he turned it into his own project in his uh, dormitory and he invented his, his own human. However, the terrible thing, as we know, when we read the novel, when we see all the movies, is that the only moment that he realizes it is bad, like all his teachers and all his fellow students were telling him, was when he's finally finished the project and the creature comes alive, opens his eyes. And it's only then he finally realizes what he's done is abominable and horrific, but he doesn't take responsibility for it. He leaves the university, he runs away from the city, and he runs all the way back to uh, Switzerland, abandoning the monster. The monster comes back to life. Uh, 
doesn't know what he is, who he is, and doesn't really know how to talk properly, but he's pretty hungry because he's been dead sitting in a grave for so long, and he goes around stealing food from the city, and every time anybody sees him in the, in the Ingolstadt's marketplace, they throw stones at him or hurl abuse at him, hit him with sticks, and he eventually finds himself into, into the nearby forests along the uh, banks of the, the uh, River Danube, and his only friends there tend to be uh, French exiles that had to leave because they were on the wrong side of the French Revolution and the animals and plants. Now, the French revolutionaries do not really, uh, well, French counter-revolutionaries do not really judge him badly because they've got problems of their own. And the animals and plants are ignorant of his, his hideousness because he's just another human. Now, Ingolstadt is also the home, oops, I spelled Ingolstadt wrong. It's also the home to the Audi car company. Now, the Audi car company went through its own scientific technological scandal some 10 years ago when I started working on this project. And this was covered in the press in uh, great detail. Audi scientists were rejigging the computers of their cars so that their cars would know when they were being tested by the government inspectors, and then they would go into a special low emissions release mode. So the government would say, whoa, wow, this Audi car is super eco-friendly. It passes all the tests. That's really good, tick, tick, tick. However, Inspectors in America were not fooled. They eventually worked out what was going on and uh, they filed uh, lawsuits against Audi in uh, various countries. And then when uh, scientists of uh, various universities started doing their calculations, how much extra pollution was emitted because these cars that were supposedly eco-friendly were found out not to be, they worked out that they, were, they probably caused significant rises in respiratory diseases and maybe some deaths in uh, Europe and America as a result. So uh, people were fired and Audi were forced to pay lots of money and change their tact. But uh, now if you go to any European country, you will still see Audi advertised as a very eco-friendly car manufacturing. Uh, company in their own advertisements. So in uh, respect of those two stories I just told you, here is a vision of Frankel Ingolstadt in the future. And there you can see the forest uh, along the uh, rural riverside area protected from the terrible noise of the cars that keep going by the city through the use of these huge, monstrous, back-faced noise barriers, okay, which reflect, bounce back the terrible noise pollution, which uh, in a way protect the uh, forest environments that the monster ended up in. The idea here is that uh, supposedly you need some form of monstrous uh, symbol that if the, the people creating the terrible noise that uh, scares off all the birds and uh, disrupts the countryside folk of Ingolstadt, if they don't particularly like these monstrous monsters, then they are, signifies the, the fact that they, they are the ones making the uh, noise. If they don't want to have to see these uh, disturbing, horrible images as they drive, they can seek to uh, choose another form of uh, transportation. Uh, bats, of course, uh, have these hideous, terrible uh, facial features because of their evolutionary heritage and that they're trying to uh, receive uh, as much sound as possible in the middle of the night uh, using sonar signals that they click out and the signals bounce back to them and if they have these huge hairy faces with these big ugly ears, supposedly they can uh, 
catch their prey a lot of bit better and fly uh, very well at, at night. Now, a little trick here is that the, the name Aldi, which is the name of the car, uh, both the car company, and is also a Latin transliteration of the founder of the car, uh, the, the car company, refers to, uh, in English, it is the words that it directly translates to is to hear. Okay, so Aldi means to hear. Okay, so uh, around the world, of course, there are many auto cities that claim to be eco-friendly, producing eco-friendly uh, uh, vehicles, whether they're electric or fossil fuel powered, yet they are also uh, producing solid liquid air waste, which is uh, not good for at least some of their citizens, be that Detroit, in the USA, Ramos Arispe in uh, Mexico, Chennai in India, and Pekan in uh, Malaysia. Okay, so I told you that Dr. Frankenstein scarped to Geneva to go back to his, his house. However, he's pretty mortified with, by his creation. And his creation is not I, if he is a monster, he's a very smart monster because he learns, he manages to learn French, which is the uh, spoken language of Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, he learns French from the French uh, counter-revolutionaries exiles in which he uh, manages to live nearby in the forests. He learns French from reading the philosophical works that these this French family has worked and uh, he becomes quite intelligent and he manages to find the address of his creator, Dr. Frankenstein, uh, from the laboratory that uh, Dr. Frankenstein abandoned in a hurry. And so he goes off to Geneva to hunt him down and ask him very, very telling questions. Why did you create me? What am I? Am I human? And Dr. Frankenstein thinks about it and says, oh, you just a mixture of parts, you have no human soul and leave me alone. And uh, Frankenstein says, well, you, aren't you so kind of like my father? Everybody else has a family. I see every single human lives in a family. Why do you not give me some company or some guidance? And Dr. Frankenstein says, okay, I will make you a she monster if you just promise to leave everybody alone, not tell everybody that I made you. And so this terrible agreement is made and uh, Dr. Frankenstein heads off into another remote part of the world. Uh, this, is, this is a sculpture that the Genevans themselves have uh, made to honor the Frankenstein myth coming alive in Geneva, okay? If you go to Geneva, you can see this. This is what Geneva looked like in the 1820s. This is what our projective future of Geneva is, okay? So the mountains of Geneva uh, is where the meeting between Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein happens. However, in the future, because of uh, climate change, the, the glaciers and the snow and the ice of the mountains is probably going to melt completely away, maybe by the end of the century. This will cause flooding in the first decades and the altering of the ecology and the problems with the uh, water management of the city. And then the water will dry up entirely, which will mean that it's going to be drought for the city of Geneva and they'll have to reconstruct their uh, water management, water accessibility schemes in, entirely. So I, I guess, you know, if we can call Frankenstein a monster, it's nothing compared to the monstrous, monstrous future that uh, Geneva is creating for itself if it, it keeps on, uh, uh, emitting climate change gases. Okay. Oh, well, we have to point out, of course, that, you know, you might think this is isolated climate change problem in one particular city, but so many uh, glacier dependent cities exist in the world that solely depend on their drinking water and their waste management uh, devices on the meltwater from 
consistently melting glaciers, i.e. ice pack gets put up there when the snow arrives in the winter and then it very slowly releases during the summer. And this pattern go has been going on for, since for 12,000 years. And because of this stable pattern, it's meant huge cities have grown up in the shadow of the uh, Himalayas and in the shadow of the Andes and the shadow of the Rockies. So huge amounts, huge cities and huge numbers of people depend on this uh, stable system of glacial water. And it's all going to be upset. So it's not just in Geneva that's going to face these problems. Even bigger cities around the world are going to face this problem. Uh, and they are facing this problem at, at the moment, particularly in uh, the Andes, where the, the glacial meltwater is, is very uh, fast, much more fast than uh, we predicted even a, a decade ago. Okay, so Frankenstein gets to the outer uh, islands of uh, Britain, an island just off the coast of Scotland in the Orkneys in a tiny little town called Stromness. And there he promises, okay, Frankenstein, leave me alone. I, if I build you a she-monster and you can get married and have your family, okay? And he's, he goes through the whole process again. He thinks he's scientifically very capable, technologically very adept. He builds this monster from digging up graveyards of dead and dying uh, women and sews it together and zaps it with electricity. But during the storm one night, he goes through the same moral problem. He thinks, oh, ah, I cannot bring this she monster alive because what if the she monster and the first monster I made start reproducing and there's a whole lot of baby monsters that go to uh, occupy the cities of Europe. It'll be mayhem for the human population. So instead of zapping the monster back into life, right in front of the first monster he makes, he cuts the she monster into bits to make sure the problem is not going to be solved. But of course, the, the first monster he made is extremely anguished by seeing this and says, okay, you destroyed my potential family. I'm going to go back to Geneva and I'm going to kill all your family. And so he runs back to Geneva with uh, Dr. Frankenstein hot on his tail trying to get there before his, his family is murdered. Unfortunately, his family, by the time Dr. Frankenstein is there, just about all members of his family have been attacked and slaughtered by uh, Frankenstein, the Frankenstein monster. So maybe this is just dessert, desserts. Maybe it's just a terrible tragedy for man and monster. So this is what Stromness looked like at about the time that uh, Frankenstein was written. Then it was a, a very important whaling town. Uh, whaling was, whale oil served as the fossil fuel of the early 19th century. These days, Stromness is trying to survive uh, through the adoption of wave energy, and it's one of the wave energy capitals, or tr is trying to be one of the wave energy capitals of the world, which is you know, potentially great if we can harness energy of waves. We won't need uh, to kill whales, let alone uh, dig up fossil fuels. It's also an <laughs> eco-tourist capital because they have an, an important uh, uh, seabird colonies, which attract uh, high uh, uh, very wealthy um, tourists who come and spend money on the island. However, the problem with climate change is that the North Atlantic circulatory systems are going to be upset. The currents that flow all the way up from the uh, Caribbean uh, in the coast of the uh, North America, then across to um, Europe, usually keep Europe quite warm. However, they're being upset, and you know, some scientists are predicting that they're, they're going to be broken. This, this uh, current in the sea and the air is going to be broken in the next few decades, and that the worst case scenario is that Europe is going to be plunged into an ice age. A medium case scenario is 
is that there's going to be a, some sort of permanent hurricane system is always flowing over uh, Britain, a permanent a perma storm environment, meaning that it's going to be uh, extra energy in the atmosphere, extra energy in the sea. The only way physically that the sea can dissipate this energy is by having these hurricanes that are, are coming uh, ever more uh, uh, popular, ever more commonly. So that poor little Stromness is buffeted by storms almost every single day of the year, ruining the uh, economy, which relies on fishing, relies on tourists to go and see the birds, relies on wave energy, all these great uh, climate change um, averting technologies just get blown out of water because the wave energy is just too great for the actual wave machines that are, are there. They just, they just cannot function, they get broken up. So even the solutions cannot solve the uh, Frankenstein future of strongness. Okay, so it's not just strongness, just about every city in the world will have their infrastructure and biodiversity challenged by climate change. And there is records of this happening at the moment and in the future it's, it's only gonna get worse. Some of this infrastructure is gonna be specifically about adapting to uh, climate change, walls built around cities, uh, flood walls on the banks of rivers. It's just not gonna be able to handle the uh, stormy environments of the future. And some of the ener energy uh, projects, design green energy projects, the wind turbines, the hydroelectric power dams, the nuclear power plants, they're just not going to be able to handle the weather and the climate events that are going to come every few weeks at the end of the century in the future. So even our best uh, state-run infrastructure to handle the climate change just is not going to work. Coming to the last bit of the story, Franken's, Dr. Frankenstein follows uh, his creation in a path from Stromness to Geneva, sees his murdered family and realizes, okay, there's one thing I got to do before I die, and that's to kill that monster. It's his monster, of course, but in the novel he says that monster or that beast or that creature. He doesn't admit to it being his, his own. So heading towards the end of the novel, he is finally taking responsibility for his creation, but it's in, in a sort of a negative way in that he's, he's going to chase his monster down and try and kill it rather than you know, teach it how to belong to society. So it just, it just gets worse psychologically for both him and the monster. And so he chases the monster from Geneva to the Mediterranean Sea. The monster gets on a ship, travels to the Black Sea, then walks all the way up there. You can see the city Arkhangelsk marked out in the northernmost parts of Russia. There are very specific literary reasons why Shelley chose this particular city, because this is where explorers and her part of the early 19th century were setting out to discover the North Pole. Uh, they, they, they never succeeded and they got into trouble trying, but it's a story which was in the papers at the time, all the time. It was a, a modern day scientific uh, story of 19th century newspapers. Uh, and Dr. Frankenstein follows him. The strange thing is, though, is that Doc, the Frankenstein monster is leaving trails like footprints in the snow, broken leaves, so that Dr. Frankenstein can follow him. So to the creature, even though Dr. Frankenstein abandoned him and is now trying to kill him, this is his only family because Dr. Frankenstein created him and is in a way his father. So the creature wants to get away and avoid dying, but cannot tether, not, not slice the tether between him and his only reputed family. So this is the reason that Dr. Frankenstein can follow him. However, Dr. Frankenstein is not so sentimental. He just wants to catch up and kill him. So uh, 
with regard to uh, the city of Archangelsk, this is what it looked like in uh, the time of Mary Shelley. It was quite a wealthy city because it was the port city for both uh, some whaling endeavors, as I tried to explain, where, uh, whales oil was like the fossil fuel oil of the early 19th century, lighting up many a city, and also the sealing industry and the fur trapping industry, all very uh, wealthy, uh, very important industries in the early 19th century. So Archangelos was comparatively then a, a, a very wealthy uh, city and an important port for the whole of the uh, polar regions of Europe and Asia as well. This is what it looks like now. It's still an important port. Uh, this is during the summer. During the winter, the river and the waterways are all iced over for six months of the year. However, every year, the ice coverage gets less thinner and uh, less extensive over the, the annual season. So the ice breaks up earlier each year and the ice forms later each year. The Russians, if you're a Russian shipping uh, magnate, you think this is a, a great thing because this means you can ship these products, often gas, but also Russia's products, clear across the Arctic Ocean during out the, the whole time of the year. So Russian products can be exported from Russia to China, uh, the whole of the year very easily. And this is uh, very good. So you Russians sometimes do not look at climate change as something negative, it's something good for the economy and not something we should regard as necessarily only a challenge, but also an opportunity. However, if climate change gets much worse, there is the problem that the frozen soils around Arkhangelsk and the hundreds of cities of Siberian cities like it is melting. And this creates uh, fragility and uh, problems in the subsoil environment. And these huge sinkholes are opening up in Siberian towns and sometimes infrastructure falls into it or cars or uh, a lost uh, reindeer herder falls into it. And the problem is, when they happen in old graveyards, and this is uh, happens in actual fact, I'm not just making this up in science fiction, uh, dead and dying reindeer and uh, people buried during the plague histories of Siberia are on Earth, and anthrax spores are expressed into the environment. And there has been anthrax outbreaks in the past few decades in the very northernmost parts of Russia. Of course, anthrax we can handle because it can be treated easily by uh, modern antibiotics. But if it's something more viral and it will take two or three years to come up with a, uh, a vaccine like it, it did in, in the latest uh, pandemic, then we have two or three years of dealing with this hideous uh, medieval virus that comes back to life. And by then, you know, maybe the, the death rate is going to be even worse than COVID-19 and it's going to create even more problems. And this is a problem created uh, by climate change and climate change affecting the soils and the frozen soils of northern Russia. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's just one part of the world and not anything to do with the tropics, not anything to do with most of the way of the people live. But the Siberian region is a huge, massive geographical area and the amount of methane and carbon dioxide that melting sinkholes can produce only makes the mass, only makes climate change worse. When methane is released from these sinkholes, the methane might actually become a significant global warming factor to start what is what uh, some worst case scenario people call a methane death spiral so that climate change goes even faster than we can currently predict. Okay. But sinkholes aren't just going to be applied to uh, these uh, Siberian cities in recent years because of changing underground flood water brought on by climate change. Naples, Schmalkald in, in Germany, Benguet in Philippines, Guatemala City in Guatemala, a region in uh, China, Seoul in Korea, plus the Dead Sea 
in Jordan, which happens to be drying up, they've all been affected by sinkholes. And it causes infrastructure problems. It like, you know, it looks like a tiny little hole, well, a, a big hole to humans, but a tiny little hole on a city scale. But if your main water system is, is going through this particular part of the city, it's gonna disrupt uh, the, the city's water supply for months of the year. Now, the, the, the uh, Arkhangelsk sinkholes also highlight that climate-induced diseases is gonna be a real problem and a real rapidly changing problem for every part of the world, including the tropics. And it's estimated that nearly 60% of waterborne, vector-borne diseases are going to get worse or are gonna be more widely spread or for sure become harder and more difficult to manage, more costly to manage as well, due to moderate levels of climate change. But if there are great levels of climate change, then it might go higher than that 60% range. Of course, I, I don't need to uh, remind you the importance of health policy to uh, the, the uh, welfare in the developing world. Here's a short list of some of those diseases in, in my particular uh, the country that I work in, which are now being measured to be getting worse. Okay, so just in case, oh, I have to tell you the last part of the Frankenstein story. Okay, so uh, Dr. Frankenstein eventually follows the tracks in the snow to find, to try and find his, his son slash creature slash creation slash monster. But before he can find him, he falls down dead in the polar snow and the polar ice. At that point in time, the creature turns around, walks back to the scientist, cradles the scientist in his arms, wraps him in warm blankets and tries to nurse the dying doctor back to life. Now, unfortunately, we don't really know what happens in most of the Frankenstein tales. We are led to believe the scientist dies and the, the monster goes off to live alone or die alone there. The lesson that we're supposed to get is that the human scientist is perhaps more of a monster than the actual monster is created because he no, shows no care or compassion for his creature. Yet in the last instance, the creature shows some human care for the scientist that's created him and eventually tried to kill him. And uh, when I published my academic as well as popular articles about this, the, the story that I, I try and invoke on, on, on to the readers that, you know, perhaps we are the modern day monsters and that we are creating this monstrous world of a very badly affected climate changed uh, future. And our cities are suffering now because of it, but we are blind to see the suffering that as is happening now. And it's gonna be even worse for our children in the future. You know, obviously, I'm not the only person to come up with this idea. Okay, just in case you think my story is too Eurocentric, have I gone too long there? <laughs> okay, it's, I'll just... it's fascinating stuff. I, I, I wouldn't want to stop you anyway. Carry on. Okay, so I'll just finish up by saying... The project evolved from its European center, you know, naturally enough, because I lived a long time in Asia, to focus in other cities around the world. So we have Franken Tokyo case studies, uh, Franken Palo Alto, the Sicil Silicon Valley in the future, okay, in the age of AI, when uh, very wealthy people can download their memories into software just before they die and then upload it into artificial creatures. I mean, people, the, the, the rich silicon 
belly technopreneurs are spending billions on doing this. It's not something just from science fiction. You know, there's research projects in Silicon Valley and trying to make this happen. Uh, this is Frank and Lanzhou. Lanzhou was a small city, but they decided that it had to get bigger. But the only way they could do it is by flattening the mountains around the city. Now, when you're big and powerful enough as a city or a country or a species to flatten whole mountains, I think it's time to reflect on what you're doing and what could go wrong. And this image is of a geologically broken future where climate change takes those flattened mountains and, and starts uh, eroding the cities from beneath. This is Frank and Santiago and the sea level rise gets uh, so bad we have to start living under the sea. Frank and El Alto, one of these uh, glacial water dependent cities, the, one of the biggest cities of Bolivia, that goes will go through floods and then go through drought in, in quick succession in the near future. Uh, this is where I am at the moment. Frank, Bangkok is predicted to, some people say, half disappear. Some people say fully disappear by the, the end of the century, depending on which scenario analysis you, you follow. Frank and Perth, this is uh, where I uh, studied and worked a long time in which uh, the deserts of Australia become even more expense, uh, extensive. Frank and Dubai, I mean, technology can succeed. If you build your own islands, you can survive sea level rise. So this is the future of Dubai. So my final suggestion to you, if you think this is too pessimistic or too general, if you're an urban planner, uh, too conceptual, if you're uh, right down the middle of politics, maybe lead too radical, or if you're a serious scientist, you think it's too abstract or too anti-technological, or if you, you know you think because Frankenstein is a European story about Europe, it's too Eurocentric, or maybe because it's pretty pictures that some uh, crazy urban designer did, you think it's too arty, or maybe you think it's too anti-scientific or too whatever. I would encourage you in the classroom or in the, uh, your day off, sipping coffee, try your own, try to utilize your own favorite work of literature, of your own national literature, wherever you're from, one of our five countries, and apply it to our own chosen city and see what you or your students come up with, okay? They don't have to choose a dystopian, terrible, anti-technological novel like Frankenstein. They can choose something more agreeable, more positive. Or they can look at uh, an alternative utopian project. This is a book in which in, instead of looking at the worst case scenarios, I look at the, the best case scenarios where people take seriously their pledges in the each uh, climate change, international climate change meeting. People take the new Green Deal uh, seriously. People take the ideas of social fairness and democracy uh, seriously, and you can come up with alternative futures, okay? And so that's it. I can stop there. I'm sorry if I, I, I took the watch away, so I don't know how long I <laughs> over time. But thank that's you for absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. Thank you so 